insightful commentary, and your feedback. Afternoons with Rob Breckenridge. This is why talk radio matters. Call or text 403-974-8255. Afternoons with Rob Breckenridge. 770 CHQR. Well, whatever your feelings are about the outcome of the 2015 election here in Alberta, there is no doubt that it was historic, perhaps even on par with 1971. It was the end of an era, an end to four decades of dominance by the Alberta PC party. And here we are today, four years later, that party doesn't even exist. Now, it's entirely possible that this NDP government will end up being a one-term government. But it doesn't change the historic nature of what happened in 2015. So as we gear up for another election campaign, uh, there's a new book out from Mount Royal University looking at how significant that was in the ensuing four years. It's called Orange Chinook. That word's feeling good. (laughs) Sounds good on a day like this. Orange (laughs) Chinook. Politics in the New Alberta. Uh, Dwayne Bratt, professor and chair in the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University, one of the authors of this book, and is in studio with us. Dwayne. Thanks for coming in here. Appreciate this. Hey, no problem, Rob. And congrats on the book. Thank you. Uh, so the impetus then, is, is it to you know tap into how and why this happened to help people understand what was so historic about it? There's multiple reasons. And, and really the origins of this start in about the spring of uh, 2016, so about a year after the election. And we wanted to do several things. We wanted to try to explain what happened. And I would argue mm-hmm. it was even bigger than 71, because 71, you saw a urban conservative party, the PCs, defeat Mm -hmm. roughly a a rural conservative party. This was a fundamental ideological shift. Um, And so explaining that, not just to Albertans, but to the rest of the country, to what exactly transpired in 2015, that was obviously objective one. Right. Objective two is even by the, 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 uh, the first year anniversary, there was a realization that the NDP was bringing in lots of changes, probably the most radical changes we've seen in this province since the first term of Ralph Klein. Mm -hmm. And so putting that into context, so there's only one part of the book that actually deals with the election. Everything else is about what did they do next? And we wanted to put some sort of context. So when we assembled the writing team, we wanted every top political watcher from the province Um, We wanted political scientists, we wanted economists, there's some journalists in there, there's some communications people, and we brought one guy in from outside of the province, uh, Graham White, who's Professor Emeritus at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and he writes a chapter comparing the Bob Ray government and the Rachel Notley government. Very, a lot of similarities in how they emerged. They arrived just as a major recession is hitting each province. It was an unexpected victory with an inexperienced group who'd never been in power before, The difference was Notley had the Bob Ray experience. So she knew some of the pitfalls not to do, and so she made some of her own pitfalls. And then the final chapter, uh, written by David Stewart and Anthony Sayers at the University of Calgary, looks at the formation of the United Conservative Party in this uh, time period and kind of sets up the stage for the 2019 election. Right, and again, and I mean, look, we'll, we'll see how that election plays out, but I mean, it speaks to how much politics has changed, right? The fact oh, that absolutely. we've got this, this whole new party. Yeah, it wasn't just that the NDP won, and in fact, the 2015 election, in a sense, um, ties in sort of the history of Alberta, where we elect dynasties. And then we suddenly throw that dynasty out and replace it with a party who'd never been in power before. Um, The NDP, going into the 2015 election, had four MLAs. Mm -hmm. They had never even come close to winning an election. And all of a sudden, we threw out this major dynasty who'd been in power for 44 years um, and replaced it with someone brand new. How much of it, though, is, is due to Rachel Notley? I, I really don't think that if, you know, David Egan had won the leadership in 2014, that we'd be sitting here today talking about an NDP government, would we? It's really about Rachel Notley, and there's multiple chapters that, that focus on her. So there's a chapter on the polling of the 2015 election by Janet Brown and John Santos, and they clearly show that the shift occurs the day after the debate. Most debates don't matter. That one did. And it wasn't just Rachel Notley's performance. It was also the fact that Jim Prentice, by focusing on her, told the audience, if you don't like the PCs, 
This is the alternative. It's not Brian Jean. The alternative is Rachel Notley. Um, there are several chapters that really emphasize her brand, her role. Her fingerprints are all over this this book. Well, and, and like, I mean, we're seeing that already in the lead up to the election, where it's you know it's Team Notley, not not yeah. Team NDP. <laughs> right. Oh, exactly. And you know, you talk about some of the problems that the Alberta NDP and Notley has with the federal NDP. Yeah. And they've gotten a lot worse, but they were in place in 2015. Thomas Mulcair wasn't particularly popular in this province. She made sure that he never showed up during the election campaign. Uh, Jagmeet Singh has made it even worse. And so uh, it it really is about Rachel Notley. And it also shows just how unexpected the victory was. Melanie Thomas writes the chapter about why we chose the NDP. In the pre-planning for the campaign, when the NDP was strategizing, They had high hopes for the election. They thought they could win eight seats, maybe 10 at the most. And they formed government. They focused on getting Shannon Phillips elected in Lethbridge, and they did that. And they focused on Joe Cece in Calgary. They didn't focus on anyone else in Calgary. They thought, he's going to be our star candidate. Maybe we can win a seat in (laughs) Calgary. And, And they won a dozen. And there were a number of reasons for why that occurred. Um... I, my chapter is why the PCs lost 2015, and there's um, some of it was about Prentice's campaign. The two big things was the floor crossing, the Wild Rose floor crossing, which was seen as greatly damaging to democracy, and then the early election call. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed candidates from the PCs, both winning and losing candidates and staffers, and that's all they heard was, you destroyed democracy, and then you kicked them while they were down. And it, it did seem, you know, as you look back at that campaign, I remember early on thinking that, you know, I mean, Brian Jean could end up being the next premier. Yeah. And I, I think part of the, the narrative from, from that election is that it, it kind of went south for, for him. You know, that maybe they didn't run a great campaign, or, or maybe he had his own issues. Did they, do you think they let it slip away? I don't know if they could have pulled this this off because the contrast of Notley and Prentice was so striking. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure you had the same contrast between Brian Jean and, and Jim Prentice. And the Jean people and the Wild Rose people had very different goals going in. I mean, they had just been decimated with this floor crossing. They just had a leadership race. Brian Jean had just become leader. People in Alberta didn't know who Brian Jean was outside of Fort McMurray. People knew who Rachel Notley was. And part of that was the legacy of her father. She had been elected politician for for a while. Brian Jean, on debate night, had to introduce himself. Never a good idea. Uh, You know, certainly there was. I mean... I think part of it was there were a lot of people who wanted to vote against the PCs, and so there were protest votes going to Wild Rose, protest votes going to NDP. But, you know, and the whole premise of the UCP was that, look, we have two right-of-center parties. They split the vote. We can't yeah. let that happen again. So how much of a factor was that? In well, the, the vote splitting was part of that. But at the same time, the NDP did get 40% of the vote, mm-hmm. right, which is pretty pretty significant. But I, uh, in some of the number crunching that David Stewart has done, about eight points of that 40 were by people who'd voted the Wild Rose Party in 2012. This was not yeah. an ideological election. People didn't just say, you know, I supported Daniel Smith and Wild Rose in 2012, but I'm going to vote NDP in 2015. <laughs> right. It was, we want to throw the bums out. Yeah. And who is the best bet to throw those bums out? And they chose Rachel Notley. Right. And, you know, look, it's entirely plausible that the vast, vast majority of those people aren't going to do that again. Right. But the fact that they did in 2015 is pretty significant. Oh, absolutely. And while I talked about the problems with Jim Prentice and, and the mistakes that he made, he was also taking over a very difficult party. I mean, ever since Klein was pushed out, then they went with Stelmack, then they had Redford, you know, then they had uh, Dave Hancock. They were throwing leaders out you know, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, over and over again. And at a certain point, people go, we just can't trust you guys. There was just so many scandals. And switching leaders at the last moment worked. And then it worked again. And there's only so many times you can keep going to this to this well. And so I think it's it's tough to put the blame solely on Jim Prentice because if he hadn't come in in 2014, he 
they would have been just as bad. It could have been. Or yeah. imagine if Allison Redford had somehow had managed stayed. to survive, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Dwayne, let's take a break here. We'll come back. We'll talk more about, you know, the NDP approach to governing, trying to find that balance between being cautious and ambitious, pragmatic and ideological. Uh, we're speaking with Dwayne Bratt, one of the editors of the new book, Orange Chinook, Politics in the New Alberta. We're back with more right after this. Dwayne Bratt, Mount Royal University in studio with us, talking about the new book, Orange Chinook, Politics in the New Alberta. And, you know, certainly politics changed in a lot of ways in May of 2015. Let's talk about, you know, the, this NDP government maybe didn't expect to win this election. A lot of inexperience in their ranks. They, they've got a mandate. They obviously want to show Albertans that they're, they're pragmatic. They're, they can be middle of the road, but... They also want to change the province. So what's your sense looking back on the balance they, they tried to strike there? I think the best section of the book to, to look at that is there's three chapters on energy policy. There's one on the carbon tax, which shows we're going to do something completely different. And we are going to transform this proce- uh, mm-hmm. province. There's a chapter on the oil sands, which shows um, a divergence from what Klein and, and Stelmack had done but it almost goes back to similar policies on the oil sands that Peter Lougheed had. And then the third chapter on pipelines that Deborah Yedlin, the former business columnist of the Calgary Herald wrote, and I go by the title. It's called Rachel Notley, the Accidental Pipeline Advocate. (laughs) Because when they were in opposition, they opposed pipelines. They wanted to build refineries and they opposed pipelines. And then she comes into office and realizes I'm not in opposition anymore. I'm the government of Alberta. And her pipeline strategy hasn't worked in the sense that a pipeline hasn't been built yet, although I remain optimistic that eventually right. uh, Trans Mountain will be. But it's how she went about doing it and the style that she took on that and, and the work that she did primarily with the federal government on getting pipeline access. And they stopped talking about refineries because they realized the economics just wasn't going to work. The fact that in December of 2018 they started talking about refineries again shows that they were desperate. Right. And and that they needed something after the decision on the Trans Mountain Pipeline delayed it in August of 2018. To me, the biggest example of that, that I could point to where they tried to be pragmatic was on the royalty review. Because oh, that was okay. another issue, right, where, you know, we're getting ripped off, we're not yep. getting our fair share. Uh, but that, that royalty review and what came out of that I was I want to put share. those t- two issues together uh, yeah. because the UCP has been making a lot of hay about how the NDP hid their carbon tax plan. Uh, mm-hmm. And all they said, because it wasn't in the platform, all they said was we're going to do something about climate. Yeah. Well, what happened is, is they get elected and they create a commission led by Andrew Leach, the economist at the University of Alberta. They do all sorts of consultations, both publicly and with uh, environmental groups, business groups, indigenous groups, and they come up with this consumer-wide carbon tax. And the NDP government looked at that and said, all right, we're going to adopt that. They did the same thing on royalties. In fact, in their platform, they were specific. We are going to increase and make more competitive royalty rates. Yeah. They get elected. They form a commission. They, do, they don't do public hearings, but they do investigative hearings. They recommend some twigs here, some twigs there, but no, we're not going to raise royalty rates. And they listened, and they didn't do that. And that's an illustration of the governing style that she did on, on energy, because there weren't a whole lot of geologists and engineers and oil executives <laughs> right, exactly. in that caucus. So you could argue that's a broken promise, though, not one that there's a lot of people angry about. Yeah, no one's going, <laughs> oh, my God. Well, there are people. Well, there's a few. I mean, yeah. like Gil McGowan's an interesting example of somebody who's pretty partisan yes. when it comes to the NDP, but has called out Rachel Notley on occasion. And they were, you know, the AFL was upset about that. Yeah, they were. And so was the federal NDP. And so was the BC NDP. And Notley... Um, is a member of the NDP, but she's an Alberta NDP person. And, and they modified it, and, and they were much more pragmatic on that issue. On the farm bill, less so. And, and yeah. I think they, the, the chapter that Roger Epp from the University of Alberta writes on rural Alberta, they fundamentally misunderstood this issue. 
and part of it is they're an urban party. There's a couple oh, yeah. seats yeah. that they've got in North uh, North Alberta, um, but really they're an urban party. And when they those issues of carbon tax combined with the farm bill, and even Rachel Notley, who claims, you know, I grew up in the farm and grew up in Peace River, mm-hmm. um, when she said to farmers, we'll just take public transit, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, there, yeah. there isn't an LRT uh, in, in areas like that. It, it showed an, a, a tone deaf uh, party. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, yeah, I, I think a lot of people would agree too. You, you got the sense that looking back that they wanted to do a lot of this in the first couple of years. Yep. That let's be ambitious for the first two years and you know, hope that we can move on from some of that and that the economy recovers that, the, yeah. you know, the second two years were supposed to be a little calmer, right? Events, <laughs> events <Yes>. change, right? <laughs> yes. So they bring in the carbon tax, they bring in the minimum wage, uh, although they were, they did slow down the rate of growth that they were planning on the minimum wage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the coal phase out, they, they quickened, um, the, the farm bill. So most of their initiatives, campaign finance changes, uh, were all done immediately. What they've been doing since is really about dealing with the Trans Mountain Pipeline and trying and flailing around the budget deficit. Yeah, so the last two years, and, and pl- I think they banked on a lot of economic recovery. Yeah, they didn't and think that, the yeah. deficit or the recession would last as long as it has. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, as we look ahead to the upcoming election... Uh, and th- there's a lot of reasons you can point to that, that they, they are not likely to win this election. But and can you envision uh, any kind of scenario where, where somehow they do? I think it's going to be tough for them. Uh, I think the, the death knell was the Federal Court of Appeal decision on the Trans Mountain in August. I think the work that Notley had done in the spring, particularly when Kinder Morgan got cold feet and she convinced the federal government to buy the pipeline, um, the, the success of court victories. The problem was she started cheerleading a bit too early and there were still more court decisions to come. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of took the wind out of their sails. And you could see it that night. She has a, an emergency television address to the province and she talks about it being a crisis. And it was a crisis for Alberta. It was a bigger crisis for the Alberta government. So it's it's lots of things can happen in a campaign. At the beginning of 2015, it didn't look like the NDP was going to form government. Uh, but the polls possibly could be wrong. But are they 20 points wrong? And have they been wrong for a year and a half? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, a lot. Uh, that, that's a lot of ifs. And uh, so I just, I, I can't see the NDP winning this election. Things can happen in a campaign, but it's going to be very difficult. But I, what I can see is that they're not disappearing. They're still going to have right. a smaller caucus um, but they're going to be a, an opposition. And we're not used to a two-party system. You know, people have talked about how polarized Alberta is right now with the left and the right, and there's not much in the center, and we need a third, you know, a real multi-party system. I said, for 100 years, we had a one-party system. You know, now <laughs> yeah. we've got a two-party system. So let's be thankful for that. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for that. And, and now, look, I mean, potentially we're, we're laying the groundwork for an interesting story to be told about Jason Ganey. And you, you yeah. can make an argument that had he not come back to Alberta, maybe these parties wouldn't have merged. Maybe and they the could dynamic, still be right? fighting one another. It took yeah. someone of the political skills and the gravitas of Jason Ganey to do that because he wins the PC leadership. And that was the hard part because he's a wild roser at heart. Mm-hmm. But he was basically able to go and take over the other side and then bring that merger uh, together. And one plus one, when it comes to mergers, doesn't always equal two. But one plus one can very well be 1.8 or 1. 1.7. <laughs> yeah. And that's all that they, they, they need. Yeah. Well, it's going to be an interesting campaign. You're still thinking we're going to get to a, a throne speech, probably not a budget, but a throne speech. No budget. No, no budget. one's going to want to run on a budget like yeah. this. Well, and we saw that in 2015. Too. Yeah, that was a major mistake that, that Jim Prentice had made. Um, but you think they're going to wait another month or so? Yeah, month I think they, there's no, they recalled the legislature for a reason. And it wasn't a head fake. And they're going to call it tomorrow, right? I think we're going to go on March 18th. And then my expectation is the next day she's going to go to the lieutenant governor and, and drop the red. So we're looking at April 16th. Middle of April. But they're, they're under a lot of pressure. And the UCP are hammering away every day. Drop the red. Yeah. Campaigning of the taxpayer dime, right? Yeah. 
and they are. Yeah. <laughs> But you think they can push through that? They, they, yeah, yeah, I think they're, you know, at the, the end of the day, there's so many different issues out there. And so are people going to vote against the NDP because they called an election in April instead of March? Yeah. Or are they going to vote on the carbon tax? Or are they going to vote on health spending? Or are they going to vote on the deficit? Well, yeah, I think you're probably right. Although, as you know, you said earlier, I mean, the, you know, the early election call and did it. It haunt the PCs a little bit it, too. It so did that, haunt that, the that PCs. stuff can get some traction, but yeah. yeah, this is, I think, a little different. Uh, well, it's uh, certainly a fascinating subject. The book is called Orange Chinook Politics in the New Alberta. It was just released last week, so perfect timing with everything going on this year. Uh, Dwayne Brack, congrats to, to all you guys on putting this together, and uh, thanks so much for coming down here today. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. All right. Uh, that is Dwayne Brack with Mount Royal University, uh, one of the editors of this book. Dwayne, of course, professor, chair of the Department of Economics, Justice, and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University. All right, 974-8255 is our number. Rob Breckenridge with you. This is Afternoons on 770 CHQR. If you choose to use...